Good morning. Good morning. All right. Welcome. Welcome to uh, FIU. For those of you who are off campus, uh, welcome to the FIU Center for Leadership Emerging Le Leader Lecture and Award for 2019. Uh, my name is Nathan Hiller, and I'm the Academic Director at the Center for Leadership. And we are pleased to have you here with us today. So thank you for being here. The Emerging Leader Award was established in 2013, so about six years ago. Uh, there was some thought uh, among the center to, to recognize uh, a, new, a new emerging set of leaders who are making a significant difference in the South Florida community. And it is such an honor to get to know and to have gotten to know over the last six years some of these uh, amazing young leaders who, uh, for those of you who are in your undergraduate uh, degree right now, who are not that much older than you. They, they might feel otherwise at times, uh, but uh, it's, it's great to interact with such great role models, with, with such role models. And before we start, I, I want to take a minute to acknowledge a few uh, people who are with us here today. And first, I want to acknowledge the finalists for this year's award. Uh, first, Suze Guillaume. Uh, and if you're here, can you just maybe wave your hand a little bit? Uh, Rodney Jacobs, Lindsay Linzer, Raul Moas, and Rashad Thomas, who I know is here, just spoke with a minute ago. And Carlos Vasquez. So I also want to recognize several of the uh, members of the center's board of advisors. We have a, an exceptional board of advisors who works with us and advocates for us and really does a lot to help the center be successful. Uh, Lynn Gross, Vice President of Human Resources at Sunshine S State Health Plan. Thank you, Lynn. And Major General Patricia Anslow, Chief of Staff at US Southern Command. And it is now my privilege to introduce two of our emerging leader committee members who are also on the board at the Center for Leadership, on the Board of Advisors. Uh, first, Harv Mogul, President Emeritus of United Way of Miami-Dade. And Austin Hollow, Vice President of Florida East Coast Realty. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Harv and Austin. You're going to have a little bit of a show here. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? I'm thrilled to be here. Being part of the board of uh, the Leadership Center is like uh, my major role was being a cheerleader. And, and uh, we get to meet some of the greatest people in Miami and beyond. And so uh, for us to be here um, and for you to be here, um, it's, it's special for all of us. This award that we're presenting today was developed to recognize a new generation of leaders who are providing innovative solutions to social and business challenges. Their job is to provide solutions. And they want to help improve the quality of life in our community and beyond. Today we are here to honor an individual as part of this new generation of leaders, and she is a movement lawyer with an extensive background in activism and international human rights. In 2015, she founded the Community Justice Project, which through their legal work collaborates closely with community organizers and grassroots groups in low-income communities of color because they believe that a more democratic, more just, more equal society can only come about through grassroots organizing and social movement. Today, when you hear those words, it has special meaning in a lot of ways to all of us. I'm pleased to announce that this year's emerging leader is Mina Jagannath. She's a remarkable young woman, and we need to give her a round of applause. All right. 
While using her legal skills to build the power of movements locally in South Florida, Mina has also brought to bear her international human rights expertise in delegations to the United Nations to elevate US-based human rights issues like police accountability and stand your ground laws to the international level. As Charles L. Seltzer noted in his nomination of Mina, she believes deeply that the community she works in must lead any advocacy efforts and that advocacy must be far broader than simply litigation. More than any individual policy or litigation victory, Mina has been able to bridge cultural, political, and community divides. In a time of deep division and mistrust, Mina has an ability far beyond anyone I have met in meeting and engaging people across these ideological and personality divides. All of her work incorporates an effort to create a broader understanding in the public of the problems of the communities she serves. The recognition as an emerging leader in our community symbolizes the aspiration to transcendent leadership by engaging with society to create solutions in tangible and practical ways and build a better world, as Mina has done at just 37. The next 37 years are going to be really cool, right? <laughs> at this time, it's our honor on behalf of the Center for Leadership and Florida International University to present the 2019 Emerging Leaders Award to Ms. Mina Jagannath and join me in congratulating her and her organization for the job they're doing. Coming up here. Good morning, all. Uh, thank you, Harvin Austin, for that wonderful introduction, um, and to Dr. Hiller, Shannon, Amy, and the rest of the FIU Center for Leadership team uh, for selecting me for this year's Emerging Leader Award. It's an incredible honor, and you really have an outstanding team here at the Center for Leadership. Thank you so much. I must first dedicate this award to my parents and my brother, to whom I owe everything. They unfortunately could not be here today but I carry them with me in the lessons that I've learned and the values that I hold. I would also like to ask you to indulge me in a round of applause for my brilliant colleagues at Community Justice Project, many of whom are here. In case you don't know Community Justice Project, we're a social justice law firm, a movement lawyering shop uh, that my co-director, Alana Greer, and my mentor and nominator, Chuck L. Sesser, co-founded in 2015 to provide legal support to grassroots organizations and community groups on a range of human rights and racial justice issues. I'll talk more about C uh, Community Justice Project, or CJP as we call it, a little later, but I just wanted to give a resounding shout out to my co-director, Alana, who should just as well be up here with me. Um, Chuck and uh, CJP attorneys, past and present, Jean-Luc, Denise, Oscar, Porvi, you all have inspired me and taught me so much. This award is a testament to the work that we have achieved together. Thank you also to my dear people uh, who are here, my friends in the audience, Wayne, Stevens, the, many of the other friendly faces that I see here in the audience. Um, you're all so generous with your love, and I um, just want to give another appreciation for um, your support all these years. Finally, thank you to all of you, FIU students and faculty, for showing up. You're an amazing sight from up here, um, and it's really a wonderful honor to uh, spend my morning with you. And while it feels like I just left my seat on that side of the room when I when I think about the year that I graduated college, 1999, I have to admit that's a full 20 years ago. So hard to believe, but um, I still hopefully have a long way to go and many more things to learn. So um, today I just hope to share a few things that I've learned on my journey thus far. Now, I actually really love uh, interacting with audiences a lot more than lecturing. Um, and so I hope that we can have a discussion um, after the lecture portion, so we'll just get the lecture part out of the way and then hopefully speak more um, during the, the question and answer period. 
So I named my talk um, after a lot of agonizing. Um, Do you see what I see and are you in the frame? I titled it this way because as my colleagues can attest, I'm constantly having 1,001 harebrained ideas. And when I first tell folks about them, most people are, are like, huh? Like, what does that have to do with the law? Like, what are you talking about? And the only way that I've found that I've been able to get folks to understand what I'm talking about is to actually build the thing and enlist others in the building. So this is the only ba- baseball reference that you're going to hear from me, from this lawyer today. Um, but uh, who knows what that's from? What, what's the reference? From? Field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. And you know, I think I like to, to carry this spirit with me all the time when I'm you know, kind of embarking on, on new things. But um, uh, oftentimes, I find myself doubting this voice from the heavens. If we build it, will it actually come? And, and yet, you know, knowing the ideas, experiments, and projects that we at Community Justice Project have been putting out there, knowing that they're grounded in the fundamental values of justice, equity, and dignity for all, we have to believe that they would come. It's a wager that we're making on Miami. Surely, if we built spaces meant to raise up the struggles of those most marginalized in our communities, Miami would show up. Surely, if we asked Miami to see our brothers and sisters suffering injustice, those people in our midst who are beaten down by inequitable systems and invisibilized, the taxi drivers, the incarcerated people, the house cleaners, the public housing tenants, Miami would come bear witness. Surely, if we called people to put their best minds on our most intractable problems, Miami would show up. And Miami has shown up. Over and over again, we see people showing up at rallies, at marches, at hearings, at our salons, our justice hack, our poetry festivals, and film screenings. I must say, this award is really special to me because it comes at a moment of desperate urgency for the future of Miami, our democracy, and of our planet. Everyday people are having to toil harder and harder to put bread on the table and have a roof over their heads. Our society is being torn apart by economic inequality, and trust in the ability of our government to shore us up has eroded to a dangerous degree. We are at an ecological tipping point, with Mother Earth sounding the alarm bells in different registers with the hopes that we will listen and act. I can go on and on, but the purpose of this talk is not to raise our anxiety levels, but to raise our hopes. Uh, Because honestly, for me, uh, a lifelong human rights activist and advocate, to receive an award like this from FIU, a quintessentially Miami institution, signals a recognition that the values that we fight for every day, justice, equity, and the dignity of all, are extremely important in this particular moment. And the task we have today is to define what it means to truly build a society that is grounded in these values. It's a formidable task, and it will take all of us to do it. So much of making what we want to see happen and doing it in an inclusive, collaborative way has to do with being able to get people to see your vision with you and see themselves in it as well. It's not an easy thing sometimes to get people to believe in things that seem abstract or out of reach. But leadership is about bringing what seems a vague, faraway dream into sharp focus for others to engage with it, help shape it, and make it happen. Each of us has an analysis of the world as it is, whether we think of it consciously or not, and a vision for how we'd like the world to look. The ability to change the world towards that vision is often connected to how much power we have. Sometimes when we're overwhelmed by the magnitude of the challenges we're facing, We can feel powerless, like nothing we can do in our little lives can really change all that we see going wrong. But as social movements have shown us time and again, there's power in numbers and there's power in the collective. When we are able to tie together our vision, grounded in common values, we can be a strong force of change. When Alana, Chuck, and I started CJP in 2015, we did it out of necessity. And we did not have the luxury of years of planning to start the organization. We had no real models of how to start it, but we had a strong foundation in the community 
through the work we had been doing within Florida Legal Services, where Chuck Porvi Shaw and Jose, Jose Javier Rodriguez pioneered the Miami version of community lawyering. With the rise of, Black Lives, of the Black Lives Matter movement and our work taking us to Ferguson and the United Nations and Geneva and many other places, we were growing out of our home at, at Florida Legal Services. We knew we had to build a different kind of law office, a law office that made its central purpose the work of accompanying community groups, organizations, and movements in their campaigns to transform the systems that have produced and perpetuated poverty, racial injustice, gender violence, and so many other forms of oppression. We weren't sure that Miami would embrace, embrace us. We took a leap of faith, because sometimes our work can feel thankless, lonely, and overwhelmingly against the grain. Our systems, as they presently function, are simply not designed to make poor folks, and certainly not poor folks of color, prosper. Being actors within the legal system, we see the system crush our people every day in ways that may be legal, but are certainly not just. And so when we see Miamians respond to the charge to stand up for each other, I think I speak for my CJP and my movement colleagues in saying that we're fortified to keep doing what we're doing despite the odds. We still have a lot more to do. As the book I chose is titled, and as a Haitian proverb goes, De ye mon ge mon, there are mountains beyond mountains. But if we continue to show up, accompany each other, accompany one another, it's as another Haitian proverb goes, Mais pil chai palou, many hands make the load light. It's important to be realistic, but you can't let realism make you lose sight of your vision. I think it's possible to hold today's reality in mind while working towards a better tomorrow. People say it's human nature for people to be greedy and self-interested. It's also human in nature for people to be incredibly generous, empathetic, and kind. If we're working towards a more just and equitable society, we have to believe in the immense capacity of the human spirit to love and lead folks towards expressing that. Do you see what I see? Now, I'm often accused of being too abstract, and I admit I'm guilty of it. Uh, so I'm going to try and get a little bit more concrete. Um, I won't pretend to have all or even a few of the answers, but I thought I'd highlight some of the things that have guided me, and hopefully there's something valuable you can take away from that. So, oh, more photos. Lesson number one, stay close to the people. Is there someone who, from the audience who wants to read that quote? Anyone? Who are better prepared than the oppressed to understand the terrible significance of an oppressive society? Who knows Paula Freire? Paula Freire is, uh, was an amazing uh, Brazilian educator, a popular educator, a liberation theologist, and a philosopher, among other things. And he wrote a book called uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which I think should be required reading for all people, actually. Uh, I was going to say students, but everybody should read it. Um, so stay close to the people. This um, is a valuable lesson that I learned um, while working at a rural development organization in my ancestral home state of Andhra Pradesh in India. The Bhagavatula Charitable Trust has been transforming villages in the Vaisag area for almost 50 years through participatory development and grassroots leadership. The founder of the organization imparted a tip that has stayed with me ever since. If you want to create sustainable change and transform communities, you must educate and develop leadership at the most grassroots level by engaging those closest to a problem. You can't really know the dimensions of a problem unless you understand the plight of those most impacted by it. And the best solutions also come at this level because oftentimes, in my experience, those who gain the tools to solve their problems are not just trying to solve their own personal experience of that injustice, but in fact, they seek to prevent others from experiencing that same injustice in the future. And there's so many examples. It's a New Vision Drivers Association, the association of primarily taxi drivers that we've been working with for over a decade. Back when Uber and Lyft were being legalized in Miami, most people automatically assumed the drivers would be categorically against the, 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 the new system because Uber and Lyft would create competition for them. 
But they involved themselves deeply in the process to fight for greater worker protections because their idea was that no matter what system a driver is working in, he or she deserved good working conditions and the ability to earn a stable living. It's the parents of young people killed by police violence, Israel Rifa Hernandez, Sebastian Gregory, Laval Hall, and so many others who have fought for justice from the streets of Miami to the United Nations. From these parents I've heard over and over again, I can't bring my son or daughter back, but I can try to make sure no one else loses their son or daughter to police abuse and violence. I can try to address racism and transform the system that had, has made this violence possible in the first place. It's the people who have been evicted or have lost their homes in, in foreclosure. They say, I will not get my home back, but I will try to make sure that others in my community don't lose theirs. I will fight for more affordable housing, tenant protections, and community land trusts so that we can continue to have a place in the community that we work so hard to build. The upshot is that if you want to address a problem, you need to know it from multiple angles and listen to those closest to a problem, even if you have personal experience of, of the issue. Because as intersectionality teaches us, injustices can be compounded by different parts of our identity, our gender, our race, our socioeconomic status. We all have blind spots. If we don't want to reproduce injustice or exclude people, we have to know what our blind spots are. Go to community meetings, go to your local commission hearings, to your village council meetings. Listen to folks at town halls. Visit neighborhoods you haven't visited before. Join an organization, talk to people. It's hard in this age because most every communication is mediated through either the computer or a phone or some other device. But unless we push ourselves to get out there and meet folks, we can't really know the community that we're a part of and understand what needs to be done to improve it. Lesson number two. Who wants to read this quote? It's a long one. When we insinuate that poverty is the outgrowth of stunted culture, that it is almost always invited and never inflicted, we avert the gaze from the structural features that help maintain and perpetuate poverty, discrimination, mass Thank you. Think in terms of systems, not individuals. Part of the reason we see injustices occur over and over again, even as we may have a lot of services out there, is that we often treat symptoms instead of root causes. We see issues like poverty or racism as a, as a result of some personal failure, instead of interrogating the systems that have produced and perpetuated the poverty and racism in the first place. When we shift our frame of mind from thinking that success or failure are attributable to individual merit or bad decisions and start understanding that success or failure are inextricably linked to historical inequities, discriminatory policies, and unequal allocation of resources or opportunity, we can start to think about how, from a policy level, we can work to transform those systems to create greater equity, access to opportunity, and inclusion. We can also show greater empathy to those who have suffered the most under these systems. Homeless folks, incarcerated people or returning citizens, low-income tenants, undocumented people, low-wage workers. Sorry, I'm just gonna get a little water. <laughs> um, core to the process of understanding the systems that are causing and reproducing the harms that we experience as individuals is understanding history. In this country, this means facing the history of the dispossession of land from Native Americans, the history of slavery and lynching, the history of redlining, the history of the silencing and marginalization of women and their control over their bodies, etc. <laughs> the legacy of these histories continue until today, as we see voting rights eroded, mass incarceration, and the stories surfacing under the banner of the Me Too movement. We have to recognize that in order to avoid the dark parts of our history from repeating themselves, we need to have an honest reckoning with the past, as painful as it may be. There have been incredible efforts to surface this that you should check out. This picture that I have here is of the 1619 Project, which is a project that the New York Times has been doing this year, um, commemorating the 
400th year since the, the first landing of a slave ship in the um, American colonies. The Miami New Times recently did um, a great long form article um, inspired by a 1619 project called the 1526 Project to excavate Florida's history of slavery that dated back to when La Florida was a Spanish territory. And there have also been great pieces in The Atlantic and The New Yorker about um, black land ownership in the US and the dispossession of land um, uh, since Reconstruction. There are many, many more articles that I can cite, but the point is to read widely, read voraciously, and always with a critical eye. With the internet at our fingertips, we're bombarded by information, some of it misleading and patently false, some of it critical and well-researched. Hone your ability to identify the viewpoints in the information that you consume and diversify the places that you get information from. Apart from reading, expose yourself to a lot of different views. I have learned the meaning of humility, empathy, and solidarity by living and working in communities very different from my own, from Guatemala to Lebanon to Haiti, Haiti. As a child of Indian immigrants in the US, I grew up between cultures, between worlds. This can be dislocating or it can be liberating. For me, it was liberating. I didn't feel like the only people I could fight for were my own. You don't need to come from a particular community to struggle alongside it. But if you're going to, it has to be with humility, patience, and hard work. If you're able, travel to other places and understand the historical roots of how those societies have been shaped. This will serve as a foundation of your change work. And this brings me to think big. Already when we're talking about systemic change, we're thinking big. And we have to. If we're going to even begin to undo, repair, and heal the harms that have historically been done to certain groups of people into the planet. But we don't necessarily have clear blueprints about how to do things differently. As Audre Lorde once said, we have no patterns for relating across our human differences as equals. And yet, a lack of blueprints does not mean that we should not try to set bold policies that get us at greater freedom and equity. We see it done in constitutions all the time. For example, the South African constitution drafted post-apartheid is a visionary document full of aspirational human rights protections to set new values for the republic in the post-apartheid era. Of course, as the current situation in South Africa teaches us, much more needs to be done than just set policy. Allocation of resources and culture shifts must also accompany legal reform. But the point is that it is important to set a bold vision in order for society to transform. This leads to an amazing freedom to think of new innovations that can solve some of our more intractable problems. We have made so much technological progress. We have to believe that we have the tools to exit the mess that we're in and be willing to challenge things as they've always been. My greatest teachers, especially in the US, oops, um, have been the communities and organizations that we work with at CJP. They set bold goals and have at their heart a commitment to dignity, equity, and justice that have so eluded low-income black and brown communities historically. For example, why not question the need for prisons? There's a great article in the New York Times Magazine from April 2019 that goes in deep on this subject and profiles Ruth Wilson Gilmore one of the many black women scholars, activists, and lawyers at the forefront of this conversation about prison abolition. For those who st struggle with this concept, she asks, instead of asking whether anyone should be locked up or go free, why don't we think about why we solve problems by repeating the kind of behavior that brought us a problem in the first place? Basically, she's asking, why do we deal with violence and harm by committing violence and harm? She says, Rather than thinking of prison abolition as an absence, an absence of prison, an absence of jails, how might we think of it as a presence, a presence of services, care, and resources that many communities desperately need, healthy food, good education, access to health care that could prevent harm from happening in the first place? When we think of what we would need to accomplish a world free of prisons, it helps us open our minds to how we should be nurturing and treating people while they're among us in our community. In terms of the cl climate crisis, there are tons of ideas out there. How might we think of new forms of land ownership 
in the face of climate change and sea level rise that threaten our coastline? How might we build models of accommodating all people, regardless of economic status, on resilient land? There are interesting examples out there. I just recently learned about um, the Community Land Trust of Caño Martín Peña in Puerto Rico. They're supporting a, a, a community of people that are living in, on flood-prone land to build a sustainable community while keeping it affordable. The Community Land Trust is governed by the community for the community. Alana and I were able to start Community Justice Project because of a seed grant from Echoing Green. And if you don't know about Echoing Green, you should definitely look it up because maybe they'll, in the future, you'll be an Echoing Green fellow. Um, Echoing Green invests in bold ideas to address the climate crisis. And we've come into contact with so many interesting ideas. There's a group called Eggplant out of Italy that is coming up with technology that takes, um, you know, plastic polymers out of wastewater and creates biodegradable plastics from it. There's a, a textile company that's making fabric out of uh, recycled plastic bags. There's an organization in India that makes incense from tons of, of flower waste flower waste that pollute the Ganges River and employs Dalit women to, to, um, to work. To me, the lesson there is that if there is investment in ideas meant to address the climate crisis, incredible creativity and innovation will result. We ought to invest more in ideas that encompass both the environmental and equity questions we face. Lastly, in terms of work, how do we give workers more agency in the workplace? How can we use structures like worker cooperatives and collectives to give workers more equity in the businesses they work at? How might we shift towards building businesses that are not only driven by profit, but are also driven by positive social impact and environmental consciousness? What I'm trying to say is that big problems require big thinking and big solutions. Don't be confined by what has been done before, and don't be afraid to question assumptions. Ask, what assumptions underpin how our current system functions? Who are they for, and how might they be a source of harm, exclusion, or discrimination? Get yourselves some mentors and collaborators to develop your ideas and support you if and when you make mistakes. But definitely don't make the mistake of policing yourself in a way that stifles your creativity or imagination. And finally, Lead by example, act on all levels, no scale is too small. When we hear the words visionary leaders, transformative leaders, we tend to think that these are rare kinds of people and we can never be like them. But this, that's just not true. We each have it in us to be purposeful, directed, and inspirational at all levels. We have a choice about how we show up in the world and how we interact with it. People are impacted by our, our actions every day. This means that we have countless opportunities to project our vision of how we want the world to be. It starts with something as small as thanking your bus driver as you get off the bus, to leading an environmental justice club at FIU, or starting a social enterprise. Don't be daunted, start where you can. While history often simplifies movement leadership to charismatic figureheads like Martin Luther King or Gandhi, the on-the-ground, in-the-moment reality is that leadership is distributed, collaborative, and dynamic. And the success of the movement depends on people stepping up into their power and building a strategy together to realize a common goal. As a great Marshall Genn said, leadership is, ex is accepting the responsibility to create conditions that enable others to achieve shared purpose in the face of uncertainty. And that's exactly it, isn't it? We don't always know the outcome of our efforts to produce things as lofty as justice and equity, but we must take on the responsibility of trying to do so in order to realize the kind of world that many of us want to see, a world with less suffering and more prosperity, a world that our children and grandchildren can enjoy as much as we do. So I really can keep droning on and on at this point, but I'm just gonna stop there because I love questions and I wanna hear from you. But I'm just going to leave you with one more pearl from Paulo Freire, who says, to surmount the situation of oppression, people must first critically recognize its causes so that through transforming action, they can create a new situation, one which makes possible the pursuit of a fuller humanity. Thank you.
comments are fine too. <laughs> Thank you so much for such an inspirational um, comment on where we are right now. Could you expand a little bit more on your personal feeling, maybe you and Alana both, about how you got the notion that it was okay to take up space as any of your identities and to start a new venture, especially one that says we're gonna chart a new path. Where did you feel the freedom to be able to say you're gonna take up space in that way? And what would you advise other people seeking to do the same thing? Yeah, thank you for that question. I love your pants. <laughs> thank you for coming as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, that's an interesting question because I have to say that I don't think that it felt like freedom when we made the decision. It seemed, if we didn't feel like we had a choice. There was no choice but to start Community Justice Project because we saw that there was a need and there was, there was a gap. And for us, you know, as people who deeply care about Miami, who deeply care about the communities that we work with, it just wasn't an option to leave that gap, you know, open. Um, and, you know, we were, it, it's one of those things, like I think, I think taking up space is not something that we, either of us feel comfortable with. Um, even I here at the podium, I feel a little awkward. But, um, but you know, I think, I think part of this journey has been a journey of evolving, of understanding the city that we're in, the people that we're fighting for, the people that we are, and, and really trying to um, be as uh, authentic and um, open to um, you know, where we need to go and, and who we need to be. Um, and so um, you know, I think the, these kinds of opportunities sometimes are, are not ones that we plan 20 years in advance. Um, I don't think we either of us plan to, to start an organization or, you know, I definitely didn't write that into to, to my life plan, but, but that's where we are and that's what happened. And, um, and I, I think that, you know, I really do encourage anybody who, who feels that sense of urgency, who feels that, um, you know, you see a problem, you know, don't be afraid to, to, to try and build something to, to fix it, to try to, to, to make it better. <laughs> I noticed that a lot of your perspective is bottom up, it's like bottom to top from the grassroots. But the change that you're looking to express is top down in terms of like changing the system. What's your ideal impression of that intersection between the bottom up and the top down? Thank you. Hmm. Thank you for the question. Uh, th that's an interesting characterization. I mean, I think. I think, you know, as I talk about thinking about sis, uh, systems and not individuals, I think that part of what it is that we are doing as we engage with communities at the very grassroots level is try to figure out, you know, how do we get, get surmount this challenge of powerlessness? And, you know, for communities over and over again and throughout the course of history, Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Sorry, it has been um, uh, a, uh, the need to, to, to find power in numbers, to find, to, to actually come together and come and, and actually devise solutions together. Because at the end of the day, you know, policy and these institutions are meant to be, you know, um, things that follow the norms of society. And in order for people to actually come to some agreement about what those norms are, what are the rules that should govern our society, there has to be a process by which people are engaging in dialogue, people are engaging in this public conversation about you know, how it is that we want to structure our society. And that's what social movement is. You know, like when we are finding that the systems that exist are no longer working for us, we have to agitate for more conversation and more solutions to come forward. 
And, and the only way that we can, well, I shouldn't say the only way, but one way that we are able to, to kind of set an aspiration or you know, set, set a, a direction for us to go in is through policy. So while policy could feel, can feel top down, I think what it is that we're trying to do is actually ensure that the policies that are written are um, uh, faithful to what people on the ground want. And that's, and that's the, the thing that we need to, to do. We need to create a stronger link between the things that we see coming out of the courts, coming out of our, our legislative chambers, and the conversations and the problems that people are, people are identifying at the, very, at the very grassroots level. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Kirsten. I'm a student here at FIU. I wanted to know how you personally and even the members of your organization, what do you do when you deal with leaders or even community members that resist change, that try to keep the status quo? I think, um, thank you for the question. Um, I, I, I think that it's one of these things where we sometimes look at those problems as, you know, fixed, as something that will, like an obstacle that'll never, that'll never go away. But when you start to think about the people on the other side as being um, actual human beings, people who are capable of um, dialogue, debate, you know, people who can, um, can be moved, that people can evolve, and we have to believe that everybody can evolve in order to, to, to believe that our society can evolve. Um, I think it's about, it's about trying to find a lot of different ways of getting that person to see the, the thing that we want them to see. And so if that means, you know, somebody from the community coming and telling their story, if that means, you know, um, engaging their broader circle of people to really understand what it is, um, the, the problems that we're talking about. I think it's, it's really trying to present the, the problem in so many different ways that help, that help people get a full picture of what it is that, that we're trying to, to, to talk about. Mm -hmm. Oh, it works now. Hello, Mina. Um, my name is Jordan, and I'm a student here at FIU. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for such a great presentation. And above all, thank you so much for what you've done in our community. I know that it takes a lot of courageousness, bravery, determination, and skills to build up such a movement like this. So can you share in your personal perspective what are your biggest challenges building up this movement and how you have done to overcome it? Sure, thank you. Um, well, I won't say that I'm not the only one building the movement. There are many people, many people in this room that have all um, contributed their efforts. And I think, um, you know, some of the biggest challenges, I think, um, there are a lot, you know, I think, I think one of them, one of the biggest ones, I think, is, is an idea that we can't change. You know, I think, I think that sometimes, as, as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, we confine ourselves to things as they are, to like the particular, you know, sort of constraints of law as it is today or society as we see it today. And that really clouds our ability to see, you know, if truly, you know, we want to make sure that our neighbor down the road is not, is not kicked out of their home or that, you know, we, we're, we're taking care of, of, of homeless folks or, you know, that, that students can go to school and get a great education, we have to, you know, like, we have to believe that we can win. You know, we, ha we have to believe that that change is possible. And, um, and, you know, I've learned that lesson over and over again from the, um, ac you know, leaders and activists that I've worked with, from, from my colleagues, that, you know, I th so much of being able to move towards something new is, um, one, having the courage to kind of say it and, and, and be out there and fight for it. And the other is, um, is to, you know, do the hard work of, of actually building things. I mean, I think one, one lesson that I've also learned is that it's easy to tear things down, but it's very, very hard to build. And, um, and you know, we see that happening in 
the world now. And, and I think really the question for us is, you know, how are we going to, to actually do the work of building? And that really means relationship building. It means understanding each other. It means having conversations. It means working on ourselves to evolve and really think about, you know, what, what, are, what are my blind spots? What are the things that, you know, have, have shaped me that may, you know, that, that may make other people feel unsafe or that may exclude other people? Like, how do we, how do we have the honesty also with ourselves to be able to, you know, know how we need to evolve and, um, and, and actually take steps to, to, to evolve? Thank you. I mean, uh, uh, my name is Alberto, and I'm a student here at FIU as well. Uh, I have a question about, like, uh, I know you talk about a lot of minorities, oppression, and injustice, and I know it's there, but I also have heard a lot of, um, a lot of con controversial facts about it, and also how uh, many people from these minorities have risen because they took action and they, uh, they worked for it. And, uh, but it's true that some people sometimes cannot go out of that and it's because of this of injustice, low wages, they get, um, they get like fired from their jobs or their houses. And I was wondering if this is like, uh, this is kind of like, uh, like a mental flaw that those minorities are, are suffering from, that, that they believe they cannot do it or they cannot like rise as others did just because like they are not lucky or or they are just waiting for something to happen? What, what do you think about that? What is like the flow in there? I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I think I addressed it earlier when I was saying that it's not about individuals. It's, it's really about understanding systems and understanding history. And, you know, there is such a thing as generational trauma. You know, there is such a thing as, you know, having, in your history a, you know, 400 years of, of slavery. There is having in your history a history of colonialism, you know, and that kind of thing, like, it, it, it does get into your mentality in a way, in a way that, you know, I think um, the responsibility is not only on, you know, people who, who have, have suffered from those historic injustices, but actually of, of, of everybody to recognize what harm that history has done and what, you know, how, what burdens that has placed on people in, in terms of their spirits, in terms of, you know, what um, their, their energy levels, their health, you know, like these kinds of, it's not just, um, it's not just a mentality thing. I mean, these things, um, they're systemic and they run across generations, they run across time and it really takes, it, it has to take, you know, a, a true reckoning with, the violence of that past in order to actually heal and build something different. Nice, thank you very much. Hi, good morning. My name is Marie Barnes and I'm a faculty member here. One of the things I really appreciate about your presentation was the quotes and the sayings from different cultures. And one of my favorite sayings is a Japanese saying, fall down seven times, get up eight. And so kind of along those lines from a leadership standpoint, is there a a, a failure or mistakes that you've experienced that you've been able to bounce back from? Um, in leadership, we study resilience and things like that, and all of us mess up. So do you have any words of wisdom for times when you've messed up, failed, and been able to come back from that? Ah, so many mistakes. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't, think, I don't think any of us can, can really say that we've, you know, gone this far without, without making a mistake. Um, but I think, you know, what's been, what's been good is um, the various mentors and people that I've had around me who have really encouraged me to, to kind of, you know, to look the mistake in the eye, you know, to like, to like really understand what the impact of that was, but then, but then to, to get up and, you know, as you say, uh, try again, and um, I, I think, uh, I mean, there, yeah, there's so many mistakes that I could talk about, um, but in my own personal life, you know, I, um, I don't talk about this often, but um, I, I was actually really unwell at a certain point in my life, and, um, and that really, 
changed the course of everything that I thought that I was going to do. Like, I don't, I think that when I was younger, I thought my life would take a different trajectory. And, you know, it ended up here, which is not a bad place to be. But, um, but you know, I think, I think it's one of those things where you can't always determine what's going to happen to you. It's not, you know, you can't plan your life out 30 years ahead uh, because you just never know what's going to come into your path. And I think part of it is, is being able to kind of take the challenges that you have and sort of turn that into, um, into lessons and, and, and uh, you know, strength and, um, and uh, you know, build something new from it, not be, not be discouraged by the fact that, you know, this challenge that, is, that, that has shown up has, you know, messed up the perfect plan that you had laid, you know, <laughs> a, a number of years ago. And, um, and for me, you know, it, it was, um, it signaled to me, like for me, the, the lesson from that was just how, how incredible of a network of friends and family that I had and how important that is to really, um, your long-term, you know, sustainability as a person, as a leader, as, as, as an activist, as, as someone who, you know, does, does work that's, that's very difficult, but, um, but, you know, there's also joy in, uh, in fellowship and, um, and, uh, you know, the times around the dinner table. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have go away? Mina, thank, oh. Mina, thank you for sharing with us today. We really appreciate you being here and challenging us, inspiring us, uh, and helping us to think a little bit more deeply and challenge some of our ideas and, uh, and also inspire us. And so thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's a privilege to have such a great gathering of awesome people and great questions. And uh, we can continue the conversation in the lobby uh, right out back after, uh, after this. We'll have a small reception. And we thank you again for being here and, and supporting the uh, leadership lectures and this award. And um, we look forward to seeing you again at a future event. Thanks for being here today.